Welcome to a screen test video from Mr. Jones. Um, I don't do these very often for my regular chemistry classes. Um, I do it a lot for AP chemistry, but today you're going to get the pleasure of one of my uh, screencast videos. And this one is about atomic masses. And so by the time this is done, hopefully I will have given you the tools to be able to calculate atomic masses. And just to remind ourselves, when we look on the periodic table, um, and here's an example for helium. We see the elemental symbol, perhaps the name. Somewhere on there is the atomic number. But then the other thing that is always there is the atomic mass. And for helium, that happens to be 4.003. Now, we've talked about the fact that that number does not represent the uh, mass of any one particular isotope, but rather that it is a weighted average of all the... Uh, naturally occurring isotopes of a given element based on their abundance. And so the question is, if we know all that information, how do we calculate an atomic mass? <clears throat> well, let's move on. So as I just said, the atomic masses on the periodic table don't correspond to the mass of any single isotope. And a great example of this would be copper that I'm showing here. Because copper has a mass of, if you look on the periodic table, you will see that copper has a mass of 63.55 atomic mass units. Well, that's about as far from a whole number as you can get. That's halfway in between 63 and 64. And so the question is, what does that number mean and how do we arrive at it? So for most elements, there is more than one isotope that occurs in nature. And in fact, for some elements, there might be four or five stable isotopes that occur in nature. And so the average mass, these are all synonymous terms, average mass, atomic mass, atomic weight, this number here is a weighted average of the masses of these isotopes. <clears throat> so let's talk about what we mean uh, by a weighted average. Um, well, before we do that, actually, let me just say why we want to use these weighted averages, the average mass, say, of a copper atom or a helium atom or a carbon atom, rather than the mass of any one particular isotope. In the real world, if we're going to weigh out, for example, some quantity of a particular element, um, we're going to use large, large amounts of atoms and molecules. Remember, a just gram quantities of something contain huge numbers of atoms and huge numbers of elements. Avogadro's number sometimes are even larger. And so that means that, that you're just going to have a mixture of every isotope of that atom there according to its natural abundance. And so you can't weigh out by the mass of only one isotope because you've got all the isotopes mixed together in that sample. And so we need to use that average mass. And so to calculate that average mass, we need to know what the abundances are of each of the isotopes and then use the masses of those isotopes. Let's do a really simple example of calculating an average mass. And to do this, I've invented a new element. It is uh, appropriately named uh, jonesium. And so jonesium happens to be a metal. Uh, and as with a lot of different elements on the periodic table, we're going to say that jonesium has two stable isotopes. And it just so happens that jonesium is a really, really special element because the two stable isotopes of jonesium occur naturally in exactly a 50 to 50 ratio. And, and so let's see what these two isotopes are. Uh, the first isotope of jonesium is called jonesium-55, and it has a mass of 55 atomic mass units. And then the second naturally occurring isotope of jonesium is jonesium-56. Jonesium-56 has a mass of 56 atomic mass units. And so what is the average mass of a sample of, of jonesium? That is, what is the average mass of a jonesium atom? Well, this is a really simple problem to answer um, because there are two isotopes. They occur in exactly a 50 to 50, a one to one ratio, 50 50 ratio. One weighs 55, one weighs 56. Therefore, we're just going to add those two numbers together and divide by two. And the average mass of a Jonesium atom is 55.5 AMU. So if we were going to add Jonesium to the periodic table, 
Of course, there's not actually a space for it on the periodic table, but if we were, we would give it a mass on the periodic table of 55.5. Well, that's nice for Jonesium, but the problem, <coughs> excuse me, with Jonesium or the problem with real world uh, elements is that they never occur in exactly a 50-50 ratio. And so a great example of that would be lithium, which is element number three on the periodic table. Um, there are two isotopes of lithium that occur in nature, but their natural abundance is not 50-50. There's more of one of them than there is of the other. So what are the two isotopes? They are lithium-6, and 7.59% of the lithium atoms found in nature are lithium-6, and then the other 92.41% uh, of the isotopes found in nature are lithium-7. And so now how are we going to, <clears throat> how are we going to uh, calculate the uh, atomic mass of lithium? Are we just going to add 7 to 6 and divide by 2? No, we're not because, this, because they don't occur in the same abundance. And if you think in advance, I always like to do when I'm solving problems, think about what the answer is likely to be before I actually do the problem. If there's way, way more lithium-7, then there is lithium-6. If there's more than 90% of the lithium in nature is lithium-7, then, then it's reasonable to think that when we calculate a weighted average mass, that's going to be much closer to 7 than it is to 6. So let's try that and think about how we do it. So we can't just take an average of the two numbers. We're going to do a weighted average, and here we go. Lithium-6 is 7.59%. When I turn that percentage into a decimal fraction, that is 0 0.0759. In other words, I've divided percentages parts per 100, so I've divided that by 100 to turn it into a, a decimal fraction. Therefore, lithium-7 at 92.41% is a decimal fraction of 0 0.9241. And if I add these two numbers together, it adds up to 1, which is all of the lithium that occurs in nature. Okay, to get the weighted average, here's where we get to the meat of the whole thing. To get to the weighted average, I'm simply going to take the mass of the isotope, which in this case is 6 for lithium-6, multiply it by its fractional abundance. That gives me this number, 0.455. Then for the isotope lithium-7, I'm going to take its mass, 7 AMU, multiply it by its fractional abundance in nature, and that gives me 6.469. Now I simply add these two numbers together, and when I do, this is the number I get, 6.924. That is the average mass of a lithium atom, and that is the number that, occur, that appears for the atomic mass of lithium on the periodic table. Let's look at a different way that this problem could be put to you, and we'll do this with boron. So here's the way a problem might be phrased. There are two isotopes of boron that occur in nature. The percent abundance of boron 11 is 80%. The other isomer is boron 10, and that is the rest of the boron in nature. Calculate the atomic mass of boron. Well, what do I know? I know that boron 11 makes up 80% of the natural of boron in nature. And I know that the remainder is boron-10. Well, if 80% is boron-10 and the remainder is, I'm sorry, if 80% is boron-11 and the remainder is boron-10, I've got to take 100%, subtract out the boron-11, which is 80%, and that tells me that the remainder, 20%, is boron-10. Now I do the same calculation I just did before for lithium. I take... I start with one isotope, boron-11. I multiply its mass by its fractional abundance, which is 0.8. That gives me 8.80. I take the other isotope, boron-10. I multiply its mass by its fractional abundance. 20% becomes 0.2. That gives me 2, so that 10 times 0.2 is 2. Then I add these two numbers up. I get 10.8 which is the atomic mass of boron on the periodic table. 
Well, if you are in uh, fourth period or seventh period in regular chemistry, uh, this video is over for you, actually. You can stop watching the video at this point. Um, go ahead and get either from me or from the substitute, depending on whether you're in fourth or sixth. In fourth period, it'll be the substitute. In seventh period, I'm sorry, it will be me. And you can finish working on it in class, or you can finish out class by working on it. It's going to be due next week. Uh, fourth period, you'll turn it in on Monday. Uh, seventh period, you're going to turn it in on Tuesday. Uh, for the honors classes, second, fifth, and sixth period, stay tuned. We've got more to talk about. Okay, let's go on and talk about this in a little bit more depth. I've, I've employed a, a, a convenient simplification as I've been going so far on this topic, and that simplification is that I've used whole numbers for the masses of each isotope. In other words, I said that lithium-6 weighed 6, and lithium-7 weighed 7, and boron-10 weighed 10, and boron-11 weighed 11. As it turns out, the actual masses of isotopes are not whole numbers. And you can see I've given you examples. They're close to whole numbers. But you can see that the mass of iron-56 is actually 55.93 AMU. The mass of uranium-238 uh, is 238.05 AMU. And there's essentially no isotope of any element that has an exactly whole number mass, except for carbon-12, because that's actually used as the definition of, a, of, a, of an atomic mass. So why aren't these whole numbers? Well, you don't really need, I don't, that's not what we're, the point of this video, but you may be curious about that. First of all, remember that that the mass of a proton is not exactly one, and the mass of a neutron is not exactly one. Plus, you've got to add electrons in. So, at first blush, it would seem it would seem um, intuitive that the mass of all isotopes would be a little bit higher than their integer mass number. And that's true, you can see for uranium, but it's not true for iron, and it's actually not true for most isotopes. And that's because, as it turns out, when um, protons and neutrons and electrons come together to form an atom, a certain amount of their mass is lost in terms of what's called binding energy. And that's where the whole E equals mc squared comes from. So um, atom, atoms are actually more stable than their individual parts, than the sum of their individual parts individually, because they lose energy when they come together. Uh, and that is E equals mc squared energy, and that makes their masses to be always less than the sum of their, of their, of their individual parts. But anyway, let's just look at how that actually affects the calculations we've been talking about. And we'll use chlorine as an example. Chlorine has two naturally occurring isotopes. There's chlorine 35, which makes up a little more than 75, a little more than three quarters of the naturally occurring chlorine and chlorine 37, which makes up just slightly less than one quarter of naturally occurring chlorine. And so we generally think about these things as occurring in approximately a three to one ratio. But the big difference between this and what I was doing on the other slides is now, you'll see that I'm giving you the actual masses of those isotopes. I'm not rounding them to the nearest whole number. These are the actual masses of chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Otherwise, the calculation goes, uh, goes the same as it would uh, as we talked about before. So I'm going to calculate the average atomic mass of chlorine. Um, I've got chlorine 35, which makes up 75.76%. I've got chlorine 37, which makes up 24.24%. I'm going to do the calculation the same way I did it before. It's going to be uh, the mass of chlorine 35, which is 34.9689 times its fractional abundance. That gives me 26.49. For chlorine 37, it is its mass, 36.9659, times its fractional abundance, 24.24, becomes 0 0.2424. That gives me 8.960. When I add these together and use the rounding uh, rules for uh, significant figures in addition, I get 35.45. And you'll notice now this corresponds exactly to the mass of chlorine on the periodic table. You may have noticed in the calculations I was doing with simplified atomic uh, 
isotope uh, masses that they were that these those values were actually coming out a little bit off. That's because I was using the wrong masses. When I use the correct masses, I get the actual value that's on the periodic table. Let's look at a different way. I'd call this just a tougher problem, but it's really not all that much harder. This is all just uh, doing algebra. Um, but let, how could else could this be phrased to you? Here's, here comes the question. The atomic mass of copper is 63.546. 69.17% of copper atoms are copper 63, and I give its uh, isotopic mass, 62.9296 AMU, and the rest is copper 65. Find the mass of the copper 65 isotope. So previously we were just solving for X in which X was the sum of two uh, products. Now we know one of the products and we know the sum, but we got to solve for an X that's part of the other product. So in other words, I'm going to set this up like this. First of all, I've got to determine what the percentage of copper 65 is. And so I know that there are two naturally occurring isotopes. Um, 63 comprises 69.17%. Therefore, 65 must comprise 30.83%. So I know my percentage. OK, so I know that copper 63, which has this mass, which I've given you, is 69.17. I know that copper 65, whose mass I don't know, is 30.83%. But I also know from the previous page that, that the atomic mass, the weighted average of the whole thing, is 63.546. So I'm going to, I've got that there. Um, so I'm just going to set this up as an algebra problem. 0.6917, which is the fractional abundance of copper 63 times its mass. 0 0.3083, which is the fractional abundance of copper 65 times X, which is what I'm looking for, equals 63.546. And when I solve that algebraically for X, I get X equals to is equal to 64.9290. That is the isotope mass of copper 65. All right, let's go for an even tougher problem. But I have great confidence in you because you guys are all in this class because uh, you've gotten through enough algebra to be able to solve a problem like this. Gallium is comprised of two isotopes, gallium-69 and gallium-71, and I give the mass of each. And I give you the atomic mass of gallium overall, which is 69.723. Uh, Calculate the relative abundances of the two isotopes. Okay, in order to do that, we're going to set this up as a uh, algebra problem, but we're going to let X be the fractional abundance of gallium-69. So there are two things we don't know, the fractional abundance of gallium-69 and the fractional abundance of gallium-71. We're going to let Y equal the fractional abundance of gallium-71. When we do that, we get 68.9256X plus 70.9247Y equals 69.723. Well, no problem, right? Well, it is a problem because this is the classic old um, one equation with two variables. And you know from algebra that if you have one equation with two variables, you can't solve it. But there's something else actually that we know about the relationship between x and y. And that will give us uh, another equation <clears throat> involving those two variables that will allow us to solve the whole, whole thing. Think about what else you know of the relationship between X and Y. I'm going to give you a second to think about it. You can turn this off if you want and then turn it back on. Okay, the, the other relationship between X and Y is that uh, X plus Y equals 1, right? Because there are only two isotopes and they comprise the entire uh, entirety of all gallium in nature. Um, and therefore, their fractional abundances must add up to one. So now, actually, I've got two equations with two variables. I'm not going to solve this all the way out for you. I'm going to let you um, try and solve this on your own, <clears throat> just for fun to get some practice at it, because you're going to have to do it on the worksheet assignment. Um, but now that you have two equations and two variables, I'm trusting your uh, algebraic abilities to be able to solve this.
All right, well, that's now the end of the video for you guys. You can stop watching the video at this point, not only because uh, it's enough for you, but also because this is the end of the video. Um, complete the calculating atomic masses uh, worksheet. There are two versions of this. Just make sure you got the one that says honors chemistry on it. It's got problems on the front and the back. Spend the rest of your class period working on this, and you are going to hand it, that in to me on either on Monday if you're in second or fifth period or on Tuesday if you're in sixth period. Thanks so much for watching.